Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Nearshore Flounder Jigging, and I'm going to be talking to Captain Guy On Lee of Green Creek Outfitters out of the Wrightsville Beach area. He's over in the Pamlico some parts of the year as well, but I guess I guess home base is Wrightsville Beach. Maybe I'll clear that up when I talk to him here in a second. We're going to be talking about the when and where for flounder jigging, you know, at least during that shortened flounder season for North Carolina you know, at least currently. And then we're going to be talking about rigs and technique, you know, pretty straightforward for an exciting fishery. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools. And now in our latest and greatest effort, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us, you know, their thoughts, their knowledge, their insights on how to catch more fish more often. Albeit, I guess the higher goal, though, would be to give you guys encouragement, to give you knowledge, to give you confidence so that you grab your family and friends and get out on the water spending more time together more often. I'm joined in this endeavor, this podcast endeavor, this episode, just as I am every episode with Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative, and welcome to another podcast episode, Billy. Gary, good to see you as always, man. Good to see you again. It is good. It is good to be here. I'm I'm fond of these podcasts. I love doing them, and it's good to be back in the studio and talking fishing again. Yeah, man. And it's good to be talking about this type of fishing, you know, because in North Carolina, it's been... Uh, People miss this kind of fishing all year round, so it's good to talk about it. It's good that it's the season to go out and catch some flounders. I'm excited to hear it. Well, I, I'm guessing with that guy on is going to sort of correct me and say, you know, you can cat, you can go flounder fishing yeah, yeah, okay, more than true. that month yeah, and a half. It's true. that month and a half to keep them, and it yeah. is fun to go flounder fishing, albeit bittersweet to let them go. But we'll let we'll let guy on do the salesmanship about the when and where. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it's one of my it's. It's become one of my favorite types of fishing is just that near shore jigging. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I'm excited. And uh, to get us kicked off here, we're going to shout out to a couple sponsors, and then we'll let you guys get into it. So our first sponsor is R.A. Hitch, Raleigh Apex Hitch. They got trailer hitches, uh, bike racks, and so much more for your truck, for your trailers. Just a ton of stuff, Gary. I know you've been uh, doing a little shopping up there, so you've been snooping around the website, and I know you're in love with. <laughs> so. Well, I, I am, <laughs> yes. One, I am <laughs> conscious of websites these days since we worked on the Fisherman's Post website. But, I mean, I just like the approach. Good products, you know, a good company that stands behind them. You know, it's a no-brainer. You know, go in there, find what you need, find what you want, and buy with confidence and buy online. Yeah, absolutely, man. And also uh, Marine Warehouse Center, which I'm going to play a message from those guys, and I'll be right back to share something interesting I learned about Marine Warehouse. So here we go. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats. We have parts. We have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have it. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. All right, we're back. So, Gary, did you know... Because. I was on the phone with Lil, who does, who sets these episodes up, who says, gives me the green light, says, yep, you can run our ads. We're, we're going to partner with you guys on this. And so I was giving her some rundown of just like our reach and where we're reaching people at. And I told her like, hey, we're over like, I think at that point it was like 35 countries. And she was like, oh, that's, that's amazing. That's exciting. And I was a little bit confused. I'm like, well, you guys have store, you have a store here in Wilmington. You have a store in the Charleston area. Like, why is this worldwide audience, like, exciting for you? And she's like, oh, we ship worldwide. And they, like, shipped a boat to, like, I can't remember what country it was. But when she told me, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, huh. that is crazy. So for people that are listening and you're not in the United States, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. And you can definitely go on Marine Warehouse's website, call them, contact them. And if you need a boat shipped, man, they ship worldwide. Like, I did not know that. I did not. I was shocked because I was like, "Why is she so excited about this number?" <laughs> you know, but she should. You know, she can ship to those thirty-five countries probably. I mean, get in touch with them. I'm not <laughs> the shipping guy, but <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they're just not here in North Carolina and South Carolina. They're actually worldwide operation. Worldwide shippers of boat 
and worldwide spreaders of fish humor. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Let's hear Terrell's bad joke. I mean, good joke. I mean, joke, not bad joke. Sorry, Terrell. I was going to say, that's usually my role <laughs> is to call it a bad joke. I'm bad cop and you're good cop. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I keep the sponsors happy. But I'll let you decide. <laughs> Please refrain judgment until you hear it. All right, let's hear it. So Terrell calls me and says, I got one. Here you go. Again, Terrell's joke, not Gary's. What TV shows do young fish like? I don't know. Cartoonas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> I'm going to give it to him. That was pretty funny. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> and if that helps us keep this sponsorship going, then I'm glad you're there rooting Terrell on. Well, Gary, if they decide not to sponsor us, it's okay because our audience can support us with buy me a coffee. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. They probably hate the bad jokes just as much, <laughs> if not more. But anyway, uh, so speaking of buy me a coffee, if you want to uh, to sp support the show, support Gary and I as creators, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Fisherman's Post and get us a cup of coffee. And someone mentioned they, they haven't done that because we, ha we don't drink coffee on the show and because we don't have any. <laughs> and it dawned on me, if anyone's confused, it's really just coffee is a, another word for five bucks. For f Yeah. Donate five bucks. Yeah, you can give us five Say bucks. Say we like your work, we like what you're doing, we appreciate it, and we support you. I'm pointing to the boat fund. That's what it is. I don't, I don't tell anybody. I just mask it for coffee. Since I That's a whole lot of coffee. I begged for a boat for nearly a year. No one, <laughs> no one came up with shocked. one. Shocked. So. Still shocked on that. I thought... <laughs> I know. I, I thought, man, this podcast is world renowned, respected. Somebody's going to donate a boat to me. Well, let's just keep doing what we're doing, and maybe it'll finally be recognized. <laughs> and doing what we're doing includes a fish photo before we talk to our, our guest tonight. All right, here we go with our fish photo. We got Hillary Muller with a pair of flounder that fell for live pogies while fishing in the Ocean Isle area. Some good looking flounders there, man. Front and back shots. So if you've never seen the back, the underside of a flounder, now you have. Yeah, I like the approach in the photo. I like that photo. I like several things about that photo. And, and certainly I'm a fan of flounder fishing. And that's going to get me to um, say goodbye to you, but say, hey, Billy, t pay attention. Billy's best takeaway. When I'm done talking to Guy on Billy's best takeaway. I'm gonna, he's going to crush it. I'm ready. But right now I'd like to introduce our guest tonight. I'd like to introduce our captain guest is Captain Guy on Lee of Green Creek Outfitters out of the Wrightsville Beach area. Spent some time in the Pamlico as well. Guy on, so good to be talking to you about flounder fishing, man. Welcome. Thank you for showing up. How are you? Thanks for having me, Gary. So, Guy on, we're going to be talking about nearshore flounder jigging. We're going to be talking about the when and where. We're going to be talking about rigs. And, and I think you put a strong emphasis on technique. I think technique is the crux of the success, if I remember from our pre-show sort of dialogue. But as That's is right. tradition, we've got two questions before we get to the uh, main event. Are you ready for your two questions, Guy on? Sure. I like a little ready. hesitation. I like a little anxiety. <laughs> why, question number one, why, Guy on, should we listen to a single thing you have to say about a flounder? Well, it, it started back in Riceville Beach Elementary School probably 35, 40 years ago. Flounder fishing, Banks Channel, fishing all over the place around Riceville Beach. Uh, had a, just a blast flounder fishing, always one of my favorite things to do. And then we kind of moved off the beach and started jigging for them 15 years ago or so and really started getting into them on the offshore wrecks and reefs without having to use live bait. You could go out there with just jigs and bucktails and, and really catch these flounder. And for the past probably 15 years, 20 years, you know, we, we've had a good time on the near shore wrecks, reefs, uh, live bottoms, close to shore ledges. Um, we, we do pretty good on them, man. We have uh, we, we like those big flounder in the ocean. I do too, man. I as I said in the in the beginning of the show, man, I'm a fan of that type style of fishing, so I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. However, there still is one more question to get through before we get to the main event. Guyon, are you ready for question number two? Sure. So, Guyon, here's here's the approach I took. Guyon is a hard name for people to spell. I'm guessing you've experienced that through your years. People probably butcher up the spelling pretty good. I want to see how good you are at spelling a name that is also known to be hard to spell. Are you ready for your name? Please spell Joaquin as in Joaquin Phoenix. 
W A Y K E E N. I don't think you could have done worse. <laughs> I don't think. It, it, I'm not sure it, it a single letter <laughs> except for N. <laughs> J. I've never been called a good speller. I believe you. I'm not going to question that one. I'm, I'm going to accept that as truth. I'm going to give you the spelling. You don't have to remember this, but for our listeners, viewers, J O A Q U I N. I think you got the N. I think you got the N right. I got an N in there somewhere. <laughs> Well, let's go to Nearshore. Hey, we're not here to talk to you about spelling. We're here to talk to you about Nearshore flounder jigging. And <laughs> I right. think your approach, you know, to begin with is the logical one. I think that's where most people's curiosity lays. Let's start the conversation with the when and where. Um, Guy, what you got for me? Well, man, if you're just uh, starting out and wanting to get out in the ocean and kind of start feeling where these big flounder are, best thing to do or just start with the artificial reefs. Um, there's lots of different structure, lots of different areas to these places. And, um, if you're out there in the 40 foot, 30 foot of water to 50 to 60 foot of water, everywhere in between, there's a, there's an artificial reef around that you can go work. Um, these fish move around these reefs and wrecks and they're all scattered around these one mile square areas. So, um, you're really targeting on the down current side of any of these structures. Um, if you got a bottom finder and you're seeing the structure come up, you're seeing the, the uh, little cloud of fish that comes up off the, the viewfinder. Um, and normally it's on the down current side of the structure. Everything below that, as close as you can get to these structures are the key places to get for these big flounder. So we're talking about artificial reefs. We're talking about submerged vessels. We're also talking about hard bottom and is it similar to like maybe an approach with bottom fishing in general where you're looking for ledges and you're looking for relief? I mean, is all of this prime habitat? And if it is so, I guess still to just circle around, what's your what's your favorite? What's your favorite go to? You know, some of my favorite structures to fish out there are the uh, the big release. You know, you got the hard edges from the ships, uh, the barges, the tugs. Um, some of the ledges out there where there's a real hard relief, real hard drop off. Um, you try to fish right up against those edges. Um, those are some of my favorite spots. They produce the most. And you really move around these areas because these flounder, they'll move all over the place. Sometimes they're on the uphill side of the structures. Sometimes they're on one side or the other from day to day. Sometimes they're on the whole complete different corner. So as you're moving around these structures from the reef balls to the to the ships i really work everything and it seems like every single day they might be stacked up on a different part of this area and these artificial reefs different than they were the day before but they're they're kind of always in there once they get in here for the summer and we're talking uh you're out of wrightsville beach so our conversation is really more focused you know well your details are more focused on wrightsville beach not that they don't apply to other areas um, in the beginning, in the show setup said, you know, we've got a small flounder season for keeping, but you can catch them other times. So I was thinking as you're answering, I'm like, man, maybe someone who wants to dial this in goes out before the season just to sort of check it out and dial in their jigging game. So without the flounder closure in mind, when do you start seeing these fish out on these reefs? And, you know, is it, does it start at 50 feet and they get in closer or start, I mean, how does that work? Or what's your experience with that guy on? Huh? I mean, typically you got these fish that move in out of the east that come out of the deeper water. Um, they start to push in our area late April, depends on when the water's warming up. By that first or second week of May, we got a really good push of big flounder that have, that have showed up beginning of May every single year. And um, they're really fun to catch because if you get out there and you really find them and get dialed into those artificial reefs and wrecks out there, um, there, there's multiple two to five pound flounder that you're going to go out there and catch once you really get this, this, this dialed in out there. Um, it's just unfortunate. You can't keep them out there anymore. So during the season, when you can late, you know, mid August to, you know, near the end of September, end of September, how far off do you typically go? And during those, during that hot water time? You can find them all the way out 10 miles up to about 60 foot of water. I'd, is about as far out as I'll go when I'm looking for flounder. I typically like that 40, 30 to 45, 50 foot of water area. 
um, holds a lot of flounder moves through that area. Um, there's a lot of structure in a lot of places within two miles off the beach that you can get to that, that hold these flounder and, and have the right structure to hold them. Um, you just got to work around them. I mean, there's a, with the live bottom, there's, there's sandy patches that you just kind of float around and you, you bump into and they'll be down in the sandy patches on the live bottoms and they'll be on the, on the sides of these big reliefs. Um, you just got to kind of move around, drift around, and when you find them, start holding up on them and really fish that area good. All right. So unless you have final thoughts on where and when, I'll, I guess we'll transition into talking about some rigs, some terminal tackle and or, and rods and reels as well. I mean, you know, set me up for success. Right. But, you know, first, I always like to just make sure I'm not moving on before you got something else you wanted to get out. No, I think we're, we're, we're good. We can cover some uh, rigs and terminal tackle like that for sure. All right, man. What do you got? Um, so, uh, with your tackle, you know, my go-to rig for this stuff is your, your two ounce spro jig, you know, it's a really good, they make other, other, uh, different jigs around, but two ounces and three ounces work good. And the reason I like them is because they got this little keeper. I don't know if you can see that little metal thing right there on the inside of the hook. Yeah. It really helps a lot. You know, you're helps out there in what way? Uh, holding your grub in place. It keeps the little fish from ripping your grub off the tail of this thing because when you're using this jug right here, this jig right here, you're also using like a, a three-inch gulp shrimp. I like these three-inch gulp shrimp. I like to either tip them with one of those or I'll put these uh, fat cow jig strips on here. These things hold up tremendously well and are scented and uh, really last all day long and you don't have to go through bags of bags of other other lure uh lures but uh you know that's your get your go-to is that white jig you can get it anywhere whether it's a spro jig or whether it's a a two or a three ounce jig of any assortment but the white is really the go-to color um sometimes you get the white with the pink little stripe down the side i kind of like that one but that white one is is definitely my go-to for all the big flounder all the time you put much stock in the uh, glow color? Uh, I, I don't really think I like the glow very much because it seems like when I'm catching these big flounder is kind of typically later in the morning when the sun's up and the water clarity kind of clears up good. It seems like earlier in the morning those big flounder don't bite as good as when it's uh, sunnier and, and, and there's some sun shining down into the water. So the okay. glow really doesn't, uh, you know... I do better on just that standard white than I've ever done on any of the glow ones for sure. And then what about leader material, leader length, leader material? And I'm, I'm also curious what, like what knot you use to tie on. Are you tying like a loop knot to give it more flexibility or is you just sinking a knot on it? Man, really any good standard knot you're using because your leader uh, is going to be like a good 40 pound leader. Fluorocarbon is what I like to use. I either use 40 or 60 because flounder really don't care about the leader very much. And you're fishing right up against the edge of the structure. So a lot of the time when you're fishing, you're, uh, you're feeling your lure scratch up and down in the holes and like work up and down the edge of the wrecks. And you want, really want to get that close. You want to be right on the edge of the stuff. So, you know, there's so many different fish you can catch on these jigs from sharks to cobia to big black sea bass to all kinds of stuff down there. So you really got to have a leader big enough to handle a few different things, including rubbing that reef. Um, but it also helps you when you get stuck in those holes and you get that $5 jig, $7 jig stuck in the reef, that 40 and 60 pound leader really helps you work that thing back out versus the, the lesser stuff. And you got a typical length you at least start with on that leader? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll typically, like I fish with braid mostly. So I got a FG knot that I'll tie four or five feet of uh, 40 pound mono, I mean a uh, 40 pound fluorocarbon to, and uh, that'll give me a couple of two or three or four or five or six tries or a day of fishing without having to change out my leader every time I get broke off if I get broke off. And then what about a rod and reel? Like what do you find works best for that application? I've used like a medium heavy rod. Um, uh, your fishing structure so you're gonna you're gonna be you want something with some good sensitivity to the tip because 
the, the way this fish hits is kind of just a, a single thump to almost like catching a ghost on the bottom when you when your bait disappears down there so you know i'm like 30 pound to 50 pound braid uh, 40 to 60 pound leader you know a 4,000 to a, a 6,000 reel um, something that'll hold some line because like i said you hook into a big cobia down there and it runs 200 yards on you um, you're going to be glad you have a bigger reel on and yeah i was that medium to heavy so that's the action rod that you know you like for that i mean and we're getting ready to talk about technique but the actual jigging that's the good rod to get the good action on that, that's the one i like for out there well, man, what about, I mean, what about technique? I, you know, I know you said that's the crux of success in your mind, at least. So, you know, we've got, we've got a place we're seeing it on the machine, you know, where, uh, we've got our spro bucktail tied on, we got some leader and we got some soft plastic to put on it. So what's next? How do we start? All right. So as you're in your spot, you're going to want to fish vertically because as you're drifting around, you don't want your bait dragging behind you. It starts dragging behind the boat real far. You're going to get caught up in the nooks and crannies, and you're going to be spending a bunch of money on jigs constantly. So I like to try to fish vertically. That means having to back down in the current that without the trolling motor. You can back down in the current without trolling motor. Um, if you got your trolling motor, you can really use it up current, and really, especially with these uh, spot locks and whatnot, they make it really good for getting right on the edges and dropping these lures. So fishing vertically is super crucial. Uh, second off, you want to drop these baits straight down to the bottom. The flounders are right there on the bottom. They're buried in the sand. And the more time your bait's right down there within a foot of the bottom, the better your chances are going to be. So as you're jigging these things, you're not wanting to jig up really high. You're just wanting to bounce the front, the bottom. Just a, just a, just keep tapping the bottom like a little ping pong, just just bouncing across the ocean floor. Sometimes pick it up a little bit and flutter it a little bit but you want it to be right on that sand, kind of making a little sand cloud down there. Cause half the time this flounder bite, you don't even know they're on there. It just feels like the sand just collapsed on top of the jig and all of a sudden it's kind of hung on something down there. And when that two ounces changes, you set the hook. All right, so I'm gonna go backwards. So are you drifting or are you anchored are you anchored with spot lock? Are you controlling your drift? Like what, what are, what is it that you employ most or what are the different ways you employ it? I guess. Well, I, I've, I've fished it so many different ways. It just kind of depends on, uh, on how bad the current is and what kind of situation. But me personally, uh, I got the spot lock, uh, Tarova and it works amazing. And you can just get within inches of wherever you want to be and hold yourself right in there and really, fish circles around these structures and uh, get as close as you can. If you got to anchor, you want to try to anchor to where you're as close as the structure as possibly can be. Um, or if you're drifting you, and you're trying to cover ground to find where the fish is, is are, is uh, typically how I do it. Um, I like drifting around and then locating the fish. And when I find the fish and that's when I lock into them and uh, really pinpoint where they're at. So it and that makes sense to me. And I think a lot of people have that spot lock now. I mean, it's become popular and popular for a good reason. So if you've pitched up on, if you've, you see something that you like and you're over top of it and you're fishing vertically and you got the spot lock on, you'll fish that area. How long without a bite before you move on? I mean, typically it happens pretty quick. I mean, if you're in the zone and you've tried five minutes, 10 minutes in a little location, I'd move five or 10 feet down. Give it five or 10 minutes, move five or 10 feet down, do a circle around your zone, do a couple drops around that location you're at. If you're not finding them, keep on moving. These flounder bite pretty quick when you put it down in front of them. Um, so it's normally, you know, about 10 minutes a spot, you know, and if you find them, you start really honing into them because they're normally stacked on top of each other. And then, uh, and then I think you said this at some point when we were talking, like, as far as like the best place to start, you like the down current side? I always start down current side of the structure first. Um, sometimes they're on the uphill side for some reason or off the side, you know, they move around so much and they kind of move around in a congregation. So if you start finding one away from the structure, start fishing that little area away from the structure because they're over there for some reason. 
but they all, I mean, they move all over the place. Depends on the predators around there chasing them around mm -hmm. too. And any idea why the down current seems to be what you deem the most productive? Any, th any guy on theory about why they're down? That's the most productive side most often. That's just the protected side of the structure. You know, that's the side where all the, the little fish are kind of hiding behind the structure and they're feeding on the little fish. So they're, they're underneath that little cloud of uh, fish that come off of this structure. And there could be 50 yards back. They could be 10 feet. They could be right on the edge of it. But just all the sediment and everything and how it trickles down and lays down right behind these, uh, these structures or ledges or uh, boats or tugs or reef balls. I mean, we have a lot of stuff to fish in our little areas here. Um, the downhill side is definitely the spot to start. Um, and then, I, what was my other, I made a note, oh yeah, so I imagine that my audience likes specifics, so sometimes I like to follow up and, and sort of force you to give a number, and I'm going to do that with jigging, as far as like how much you jig it off the bottom, and I get that you mix it up a little bit, but the standard jig, the standard bounce, with the goal would be, if you were instructing me, would say, Gary, your standard jig would be to come one foot off the bottom, two foot off the bottom, like how would you answer it in a in a numerical way? Well, I, I, you know, a numerical way, I would say keep it underneath a foot off the bottom. You know, from two inches to second, you feel your rod tip break and your jig lift off the bottom, set it right back down. And when you're setting these things down and, and this jig is falling down, you want to do it slow enough that your line is tight so you feel that jig hit the bottom. You don't want to drop your rod tip so fast that you give it slack and it just hits the bottom because a lot of times those fish will hit the second it hits the bottom. And if that line's tight, you also know right when to bring it back up. You want to keep it what I call flubbing the bottom. You just want to hop it around a lot, but not very high. Okay. And then what's your experience? Is it like is it like most jigging where the bite comes on the fall or... Or when the when it actually hits the bottom of the f ocean floor. Well, sometimes when the fish are aggressive and you're having and you're kind of hanging it up in the air, you know, up off the bottom about a foot six inches, and you kind of just fluttering around, they'll come up and hit it and take it down. I like those aggressive days, but there's a lot of days where, you know, you really got to learn what exactly what that two ounces feels like when you're jigging this two ounces, and all of a sudden it's on the bottom and that two ounces changes, you need to set the hook. Cause a lot of times those fish just inhale it on the bottom. They don't hit it hard. It just all of a sudden feels like that two ounces turned to four to six ounces. And all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of stuck in some sand, maybe some sand caved on top of it. A lot of time them flounder are just laying down there and inhaling them in and you, you just can't even feel them hit. And we're talking like Bill Dance set the hook. Like set the hook hard. I like to set it hard and set it on in there and go back for another 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 hit on them and really get it in them and start getting them up because you know when those big flounder get here, the barracudas are around too, and they like flounder more than we like it probably, and they sure do like eating those flounder. So once you hook that thing and you start bringing them up, get them on up and get them on in because you know the tax man's down there and he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna come after them sooner or later. Uh, I like how you put that, man. I, I like that phrase. I like that phrasing. Man, uh, I, I guess what I didn't ask it with when and where, you know, it, what just made me think of this now is like how long out there, again, we're not talking about season closure, but just in general, the flounder habit. Um, how long are you catching them within like 30 to 50 feet of water? How, how long into the season does that happen? I mean, it starts in in uh in probably middle may you start picking up a few flounder by the beginning of april you're really getting some nice flounder i mean i'm sorry by the beginning of april you're starting to get your flounder by the beginning of may they're really stacked up good and then you'll catch them from may june all the way through november and then november the big flounder start moving back out to sea the little flounder start moving south down the beaches and then by de december most of the time those ocean flounder are about gone everywhere Guyon, this has been a straightforward conversation, man. I, everything has been logic based, but I, I'll I'll follow. I'll finish with. Well, I got one more question after this, but I'll finish with, man. 
final thoughts, man. Anything that I didn't set you up to share? Anything you're thinking at this point? Like, I wish I had said that. That That's something that they might need to know. When you get that flounder up, have your net ready. Because the second a flounder hits the air, he goes crazy, and he's going to shake the hook in your face 90% of the time when you bring him up in the air. So either you or your buddy better have the net ready prior to that fish coming to the surface. Um, sage advice here to finish our discussion. Um, but the, the other question I want to ask you, because again, you know, flounder season, a month and a half, you know, fingers crossed, whatever it is, is I, I even alluded to this in the beginning of the show saying that you're based out of Wrightsville, but you send some time in Pamlico, excuse me, guy on for our viewers, for our listeners, will you walk us through the, uh, green Creek outfitter calendar? Like what you're doing in the, what your primary targets in the spring, summer, fall, and then in the winter. Yeah, man, I run a uh, spring fishing charters, summer fishing charters, and uh, fall fishing charters out of Wilmington and Wrightsville Beach. Uh, I do a little bit of sight fishing for the big bull reds on the Pamlico Sound come uh, late August and September when uh, you can go out there and catch those 40 to 60 pound bulls on top water with light tackle. Uh, that's real fun. And then uh, come November, I'm in Pamlico season until the end of January duck hunting. I uh, run a guide service up there and we do the big water duck hunts right through the end of January. So when I come home in February, I take a little time off and then hit the reset button and start right back over with some fishing in the spring. What's your favorite targets that in the spring and summer that aren't flounder? Oh, I, I love the cobia, man. Uh, the hunt of a cobia, I'm a big hunter. So the actual hunt of trying to, to find a cobia on top and, and do some sight casting to them is, is, is really nice. I really like the, uh, the, uh, the sight casting, the really the putting your eyes on the fish and uh, trying to figure out how to approach them to, to get them to bite. All right. Guy, man, I've appreciated your time. I've enjoyed talking to you. I'm excited for the season. And, uh, and again, man, appreciate you b making time to be a guest on the show. Yeah, Gary, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for your time. All right. Talk soon, Guy. Yeah, all right. Thank you, bud. What a uh, dude. That was a ton of information in a very short amount of time. Yeah, man. It was great. Efficient. It was to the point. It was perfect. I was like, this is what podcasts should all be about. Get, <laughs> get in there, get the meat, and like, all right, here we go. I liked it, man. It was good. And I haven't done any offshore flounder fishing like that. or so. Is it called offshore, or near shore? I don't know what you technically call it. I call it. it near shore. You know, I think that's a little colloquial. I'm not sure yeah. everyone calls it near shore. But, uh. Yeah, man. I mean, a part of the joy of it is in the hot summer months, you get to get off the beach and it's typically a little cooler. During those hot times of August and September, it's often crowded inshore with a lot of boats and you get to get offshore and it's a little less crowded. Mm. And, you know, one of the things I've liked about it is it reminds you just how aggressive a flounder is when it smacks that bucktail. Because inside yeah. with bait, you know, they get the old was that a bite? I think that was a uh -huh. bite. Should yeah. I let it sit? Should I let it sit more? <laughs> and you can play that game, but out there yeah. bucktailing, man, it's there's no thinking. It it hits it, and then you're engaged. All right, so it gets it and takes it, and you're you're ready. And they, f I think they just feel heavier out there, man. You're bringing it up because they're man. typically quite a bit bigger, right? Um, like On Ion said, man, the qu you know. I deal with a lot of flounder tournament fishermen through the years. Like you might not be winning a tournament with an eight, nine, ten pounder out there, but like Guyon said, man, two to five pounds is yeah. you know some pretty, pretty standard fare out there. Which is a a two pound flounder is a beautiful fish. A five yeah. pound is an eye popper. Yeah, man. I didn't. I never even caught a, a flounder that was big enough to take home until it was like out of season. <laughs> <laughs> until they put a season on it. Now every time I catch a flounder, I'm like, I could eat this in October or whatever. <laughs> It's uh, whatever. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so it's good. Well, I will get to my takeaway. Yes. And it was pretty shocking to me, but keep that jig head it bouncing off the bottom less than a foot, even two inches, which I was like, all right, that makes sense. Like, So jig a lot, but very little in height. Yeah, so. and you you know, according to Gon, you want a little sand disturbance, yeah. man. You want it, you know, drawing some attention, man. I guess it looks like a fish down there struggling, so then they just finish it off. Right on. Savages. <laughs> Savages. All right, we'll get out there and flounder fish. Call Guy in for your next uh, offshore flounder trip or near shore flounder trip. So, sounds like a ton of fun. Go get his bait hung up. Don't hang your own bait up. 
Yeah, his seven dollar spros. <laughs> yeah, yeah, put his seven dollar spros on the line. <laughs> oh man, well appreciate you guys uh, for watching, listening. Be sure to leave us a review, rate, review, share, give us some feedback. Go to buymeacoffee.com, buy Gary a coffee, and uh, and give him some episode ideas. He always has a lot of ideas, but maybe there's something that you guys are thinking about that we're not. And uh, and also go support Marine Warehouse Center and R. A. Hitch as those guys make this show episode possible. So we really appreciate those guys. We do, man. You know, let me since I didn't say it before because I was talking a little bit heavy on Terrell. You know, sales, service, and parts, man. Marine Warehouse Center. You know, part of the boating and fishing community, not just selling to the boating and fishing community. And then I already shined up R. A. Hitch, man. Yep. You know, real store, real website, real products. And uh, thank you very much, Billy, man. It's been fun. Yeah, man. Oh, and Ari Hitch, 20 bucks if you mention Fisherman's Post. Tell 20 him, bucks. Tell them we sent you. I love 20 bucks. And if you don't want 20 bucks, just buy something and bring me 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I sound like a bomb Beggar. now. I'm going to hold up a sign Beggar. next show. All right, we'll see you guys later.